start with an introduction to myself first. First of all, it's a pleasure to be here. This is the first time I'm speaking in Modine, and it's nice to have, I'm not going to say an older crowd, a mature audience. <laughs> <laughs> this means A, you know something more than your phone, and B, you have an attention span. <laughs> the, the, the challenge is keeping everyone awake, but that's a separate <laughs> issue. <laughs> Okay, uh, just a little intro. The, how, first, how many South Africans are here? Okay, because I thought everyone was, but obviously, who's, how many Americans? Any who are neither? Some, we have some Canadians here? Brits? Brits, okay, very nice. Okay, so it's Australian, good on you. Okay. <laughs> okay, so how's it for the South Africans? And hello for the Americans. And Okay, a little introduction to me. Uh, my name is Ken Spiro. Uh, I am originally from... I was born in Brooklyn, the holy city. Any New Yorkers here? Or New Yorkers? Oh, wow, a lot of New Yorkers. Okay, everyone's from Brooklyn. The first Jewish-owned real estate, even before Hebron. Um, I grew up in a non-observant family. My, my kids were all born in Israel and raised, you know, Jewishly connected. My oldest son, he asked me, Dad, what does that mean? What did you used to do Jewish when you were little? I told him on Pesach, we used to have ham and cheese on matzah. And he, he laughed. He said, Dad, why would you bother with the matzah? I said, it was Pesach. We couldn't have bread. I went to public school. I didn't know, my parents weren't Zionist, never went to Israel as a kid. Went to public school, New Rochelle High School. I went to Vassar College undergrad, which won't mean anything to most of you guys. But I studied Russian language and literature and Japanese in college because I wanted to do international business. Those were like the hot languages a thousand years ago. Now it would definitely be Spanish and Mandarin if I had to learn something. And when I graduated from college, I could read Tolstoy's War and Peace in the original Russian, but I couldn't ask for directions on a street. Because if you want to actually speak a language, what do you have to do? You got to live there. You want to learn Spanish? Go live in Florida. <laughs> so I decided before going to grad school for business, I'm going to take a year off. I'm going to go half a year as a graduate student to the University of Moscow in Russia. And then I had another half a year to kill. I'm going to go to Kibbutz. I've never been to Israel. Go pick grapefruits with Danish volunteers for a few months and work on my suntan. So when I went off to the Soviet Union, which you guys actually remember, most of the, my students were born after it ceased to exist. When it was the Soviet Union, I assume there's no Russian speakers here. When it was the Soviet Union, it was illegal for a Jew to even own a book in Hebrew. You get arrested for trying to study or practice Judaism. The first thing I learned is if you want to get a Jew to do something, just tell them they can't. If like the Congress or the Parliament, whatever, would outlaw Judaism, every Jew would run off to yeshiva and seminary to learn. So I ended up spending six months in Russia cutting almost all my graduate school classes and hanging out with hundreds of young Russian Jews who were risking their lives to secretly learn Hebrew, to secretly practice Judaism. I, could, I should have written a book about it. The stories were unbelievable. It basically hit me like, if they're risking their lives for this stuff, there must be something more than I've been exposed to in my meaningless after-school Hebrew school experience in America. So I'm going go to I'm gonna go to yeshiva instead of going to kibbutz. I checked into Eish Torah in the old city, way before they had the nice building they have today. I was going to stay for three months. I stayed a little longer. I'm now at two months and 42 years. <laughs> Time flies when you're having fun. I stayed. I studied full-time in Eish for many years. I got smicha. So I am a rabbi, no congregation. I only play rabbi when I visit other people's congregations on Shabbat as scholar in residence. My mother told me it wasn't the best job for a Jewish boy, so I got a master's degree in history. I wear the historian hat and the rabbi hat. I'm also a licensed tour guide in Israel, an author, speaker, podcasting, blogging person. It's all more or less the same thing, just in different venues. And, you know, BC, before COVID, I was about 25% of the year uh, in the States England, South Africa, Australia, Europe speaking, AD after disease. I'm back doing it a lot again because it's not much tour guiding as a matter of fact. But everyone is really open and interested in what is going on in the world. Last detail, I got five kids. Three of them were living in Modine until a few months ago. Now I only have two and neither of them is here. I'm going to give them a hard time for not coming. <laughs> Actually, my daughter apologized. She went to a lot for three days with her kids. So <clears throat> um, everyone is really awake now. We got a bucket of ice water thrown in our face on October 7th. And people are really open. And this is not my normal audience. You guys are a well-educated, very connected audience. Most of what I do is outreach work. But even I find the basic material, a lot of which I'm going to cover tonight, is not something that people who are necessarily raised, observant, and connected went through and certainly never saw it, I think, the way you're going to see it now, all kind of rolled up. And I started to create this presentation before October 7th, but it was perfect, you know, hashkacha, that it actually happened that way because people so want to know what is going on. And I think hopefully this presentation will let, let us pull back and get some perspective on 
what's going on at a deeper level, what's our role in the story, and what we should be doing individually and collectively to make a difference, not just in Israel of today, but in the world in general, our mission in history. So the presentation takes about 50 minutes. If you guys have any questions or comments, please hold them till the end. I'd be happy to answer them after. I have a really good website with all my content. This one presentation is not on it yet, but Mike is recording it, so he'll be up on your website, so you'll be able to watch it again. Um, I, do I do tend to speak a little on the fast side, because, yeah. Hey, sorry, struggling. Can you, guys hear can you guys not hear me in the back? Is there a problem? It's okay? You can hear? Okay, I was sort of having difficulty hearing. <laughs> okay. So this present, oh, that's better. Okay, if, just, if anyone starts schwitzing, let me know. But they uh, it might get too warm now. We'll see. Hopefully, it'll be okay. Uh, so if you have any questions, again, I'll be happy to answer them at the end. Uh, there's going to be a lot of information in this presentation, and hopefully, you'll find it meaningful and inspirational. So I call it on the edge, getting clarity before the climax of his story. It's not an accident that it's written that way. But before we go to the end, the climax of the story, we kind of have to rewind to the beginning. And let's start with a really basic point. Like, what is the most important idea that we, the Jewish people, gave the world? Besides guilt, bagels, junk bonds, leverage, buyouts, Einstein, Marx, Freud, 22% of all the Nobel Prizes since 1901. What's the greatest Jewish contribution to civilization? Creator. I don't exactly. Think One God brought to you by the Jewish people. One God has massively transformative impact on humanity. First of all, in the realm of morality, ethics, law, political development. The first book I wrote, I wrote a bunch of books. This is an excellent book. Ask my mother, she will testify that is true. It's all about the impact of monotheism on morality, how it's a transformative force in human history. But one God also has huge implications for history. Because one of the things that we understand about God, even though we don't really understand about God, is he's the creator, sustainer, and supervisor. He, can, he knows and controls everything. Every particle in the physical universe is under supervision of an infinite being, which means we're not randomly stumbling through a series of events that have no beginning, no end, and no purpose. It's the idea of determinism, that history is a controlled process leading to a destination. Simply put, we are in a story. We're in a movie. We're in the ultimate movie, his story. And we're actually pretty close, as we'll see at the end. But before we get to the end, it's kind of like when you start watching a series and you're at like, you know, like the, the eighth episode, you got a previous episodes. We need to go back and get some perspective on what was happening before. So let's hit the pause button and let's rewind to the beginning, to episode one. But this, again, is very basic information, but it's not necessarily information that you may have learned growing up, especially if you're like raised observant and you just start doing things and no one saw it. The great thing about being a Balchuva, like I am choosing to be religious as I worked it all from the beginning and made sure I was very clear why I'm doing what I'm doing and, and building up a very solid foundation and we call our Hashkafa, our worldview. So let's start with episode one. When do we start keeping time from in Judaism? Jewish time starts with, right, day, day six of creation. What happened on day six? Man, you guys are so gender specific and so not politically correct. Oh, you can't say that either because man is in the word. Humanity. You can't say mankind. Forget it. I went to Vassar. It used to be a, used to be a woman's school. It was Yale sister school. They used to say things at Vassar like when God created man, she was only joking. Or what the, that's why I'm standing on the women's side, you notice? <laughs> I'll move to that side for you. Know. What did God say when she created man? I can do better than that. But what's the lesson we learn from the fact that we start keeping time from day six and not day one, which is when time actually begins with the Big Bang, with the physical creation of the universe. The lesson we learn is, boom, boom, boom. Just like a movie director doesn't start filming until who comes on the set? The actors. So too, God, the ultimate producer director, spends a lot of time in pre-production. But he doesn't say action with the clapboard till we come on the set. Basic Jewish hashkafa point number one, Judaism teaches the focus of creation is us. But when the actors come on the set in a movie and the director says action, they don't just stand there like a deer in the headlights. They got lines, right? What are our lines? What's the question I'm asking? It's the biggest question there is. Why are we here? I ask this question to thousands of people a year. When I'm asking, it's interesting. When I ask, Orthodox Jews, they all give me one of two answers. We're here to eat. eat. 
If, if, if we don't eat, we get post-traumatic stress disorder. So that could be true. That's very good. No one ever gave me that answer before. We're here to? Sir. No one, no one says they don't say that. We say we serve God or we're here to learn and do? Okay, so first of all, you can't serve God. It's a figure of speech, but God's infinite. You don't do anything for God. Torah and mitzvahs, there's no Jewish people without it. There's no world without it. It's the guidance system, the payload, and the rocket fuel of the Jewish people, <coughs> but it's a means to an end. Judaism teaches that the purpose of creation is, boom, pleasure. Now, by the way, most Jews see this, they go, no way. That's not wrong religion. <laughs> Judaism's like about being neurotic. <laughs> what can I eat? What can I eat? What can I do on Saturday? We're confused. We think the opposite of pain is pleasure. It's not true. The opposite of pain is comfort, okay? Pain and pleasure go together like we say in sports. No pain, no gain. And the more you schwitz for something, the more you work for something, the more meaningful it is, which is why like graduating from preschool is not the same level of work or pleasure as getting your post-doctorate. Like winning your Little League Championship, for those who know American baseball, there are some Americans. It's not the same as you know, winning the World Series, especially from Chicago, because the Cubs win it once every 100 years. I'm a Yankees fan. I had to get that in there. That line was lost on anyone who's not an American. Anyway. <laughs> But Judaism says that there are different levels of pleasure. Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato, we have binoculars in the back for those who can't read the quote. I'll read it out loud. The Ramchal in the 18th century, he beautifully spells out. He says, behold, what our sages of blessed memory have taught us is that man was created solely to delight in God and to derive pleasure in the radiance of the Shekhinah. For this is the true delight and the greatest pleasure that can possibly exist. Highest level pleasure relationship with God. They're lower pleasures. Like physical pleasure, Judaism says, is the lowest level pleasure. It's kind of like flying on El Al. You have like cattle class and you have a kind of, you know, cattle class with your like your knee and your nose and the guy's seat and your head is you're trying to eat. And you have like economy plus, and you have premium. Each level is a lot better. Highest level pleasure, relationship with God. Lifetimes of physical pleasure, love, accomplishment, all the other pleasures that are in there. You're welcome to go to H.com website and read the five levels of pleasure class, which goes through this. It's being a human being 101 class. Lifetimes of those lower level pleasures do not equal one minute of your soul's direct connection without all this blocking it with the infinite light. And that's really the purpose. God puts us in the perfect environment, Gan Eden. We're supposed to hang out, and we say, as we say in 1960s California slang, and groove on the Shekhinah. Like everything's taken care of, just have connection with God. The Bible should have been one Torah portion long. We lived happily ever after. But if according to the pain is the pleasure and the highest level pleasure is relationship with God, what's the hardest thing to build and maintain in this world? Relationship with God. Everyone wants it, but no one wants to work for it. How do we know everyone wants it? Because wherever you look at any period of time in human history, anywhere, what do we always find in human culture and society? Religion of some sort, faith, spirituality, because it's the deepest yearning of every human soul to want to know there's more than just this. But no one wants to work for it. It's like, I want to look great. I want to be lean and mean, have eight pack abs. I don't want to diet and exercise. I want to like, you know, eat junk food, play on my phone and buy those little electro thing with the battery pack that vibrates my abdominal muscles. Doesn't work, like dieting doesn't work. No, if like a hundred people lose weight through dieting, how many are going to keep it? How many are going to gain it back? Like 97. 97 of the 100, because it's, it's permanent lifestyle changes to be in shape and look good. It's a lifetime of struggle to build and maintain a relationship with God. And the early narrative in the Bible is exactly that being blown, where humanity says, I know God's out there, but it's so hard to do it. But I see all the cool things he created that give me all like beautiful sunsets and a volcano and the oceans and the sunset and lightning. I'll have a relationship with those as a way of indirectly having a relationship with God. Before long, this is, Maimonides talks about this, exactly how what crept into the world? Idolatry, avodah People forgot about God and ended up worshiping the forces in nature. The whole purpose of creation is basically lost. It's all about connecting with God. And one thing we see, and one thing I definitely show in my first book, more infomercials, is there's a direct connection between our relationship with the big guy upstairs and how we treat each other, which means right before the flood hits, the world degenerates. What's the word used in Hebrew to describe the situation in the world? Hamas. God has a really interesting sense of humor. Like, I wonder how those guys in Gaza thought of, let's think of a terrorist organization that's going to randomly shoot missiles and do horrible things to people. They probably call up Feinstein, Schwartz, and Goldberg on Madison Avenue. They said, maybe try Hamas as a name. The world declines. It gets 
God says, forget it. He spares whom? And his family, hoping they'll do what? Repopulate the world with people who have a relationship with him. Is Noah successful? No, he's righteous enough to save himself, but not proactive enough to save the world. Which, my friends, is a huge lesson for us. It's not enough to be in the life raft. I got my Shabbat, my kosher food, my schools, I'm okay. Uh -uh -uh. We're responsible as we'll see for our fellow Jews and ultimately for the world. So Noah is not successful. The world continues to decline until we get to what? What's that on the other side there? The Tower of Babel. What's the plot of that story? You guys know it really well. Humanity unites, but for all the wrong reasons. What do we call that today? The UN. <laughs> Which stands for? Useless nothings. I'm all for turning the building into condominiums and sending it to the EU. What does the EU stand for? ASOV United. They, should, they deserve each other. Anyway, I hope no one's here politically correct, because I am certainly not. So. Sorry? Useless would be <laughs> Exactly. It's an insult to the word useless. Okay. God's thinking, you know what? I, I, I only, this is ridiculous. I, I tried with Abraham. Abraham had one commandment, which was what? Adam. I mean, Adam, excuse me. Adam had one commandment. Sorry, thank you. Adam had one commandment. Don't eat from the tree. Not only did he not do it, then he blamed his wife. Men have been paying for that for thousands of years. Noah had how many? Seven. Think what we got after, 613. Thank God we got it right. Can you imagine the next group of people? You think Jews are neurotic? That would have been really scary. But God's thinking, you know, I tried with I tried with Adam. I tried with Noah. Forget it. Maybe, you know, the Big Bang Theory, how the universe is created. The opposite is the Big Crunch Theory. God's thinking, maybe I'll nuke the universe and try again. But thank God, along comes one human being. This is the ultimate power of one story, the ability of one person to change the entire course of human history. I hold this person as the greatest intellectual idealist of all time. Who am I talking about? Abraham, of course, Avraham Avinu, who was born in 1948 from creation. Isn't that cool? The Jewish state is born in 1948, Christian calendar year, and Abraham is born in 1948 from creation. Abraham comes from a place called Ur. Where's Ur today, by the way? It's not Brooklyn. Iraq. We all know where Iraq is. Ambrose Bierce, who wrote during the American Civil War, he has one of my favorite quotes. He said, war is God's way of teaching Americans geography. <laughs> So out of Iraq, almost 4,000 years ago, comes one man who's great for two reasons. A, in a world that has totally lost the purpose of creation and connection with God, Abraham is a radically transformative, free-thinking, super genius. He's able to think outside the box and connect to a completely counterintuitive, infinite, invisible being. But my friends, imagine being the only person to believe in a completely like weird idea that's completely non-intuitive. like How many of us have the chutzpah to even whisper to our best friends? That's the real greatness of Abraham. He wants truth regardless of consequences. He says, I choose to live it if necessary, to die for the reality of God. Abraham knows better than we know. You don't live for God. You don't die for God. You don't do anything for God. But without relationship with him, he recognizes we're doomed. We're missing the point of creation. We're going to eat each other alive. So he dedicates himself to a unique mission, the chosen people thing. Whenever I'm teaching my students, and most of my audience are Jews, younger Jews who have no background. I said, you got to be able to explain this. One day you're going to be walking down the street wearing your like mug and dove it or something. Now no one's wearing that anymore. They're afraid in most places, unfortunately. And someone's going to walk up to you and say, you're Jewish? You think you're chosen? What are you chosen for? Oh, they're going to jump all over you? How are you going to answer? So the way I explain chosen is Abraham says to God, God, I choose you. I choose to dedicate my life and the life of my descendants to one mission. to teaching the world about the reality of you and the values that come from relationship with you. And Abraham says, and God says back to Abraham, so to speak, you're choosing me, Abraham, I choose you back, you and your descendants, us, the Jewish people. What are we chosen for? It's not privilege. We're chosen for responsibility. What's the term? What kind of responsibility are we chosen for? The word the Jewish world loves to use, overuse, and misuse is tikkun olam, fix the world, which certainly sounds better than save the whales. <laughs> Like it says, and this is from Yelenu, that's where the expression comes from. Fix the world. But the real job of the Jewish people, and I believe this is lost not only on most of the most Jews, but even a lot of religious Jews. The real job of the Jewish people is Kiddush Hashem. To individually and collectively be an inspiration and a role model for humanity. To be godly in the physical world and elevate the world. It says it in Vayikra. God spoke to Moshe saying, speak to the whole Israelite community and say to them, you shall be holy for I, your God, am holy. And it says in Shmot, for now, for now then, this is right before, I love this quote. This is right before we get to Torah at Har Sinai. Now then, if you obey me faithfully and keep my commandment, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine, but you shall be unto me mamlechet koanim v'goy kadosh, 
a nation of priests and a holy people. That is our job. As Yeshaya said it beautifully, this idea of light to nations. And Yeshaya is probably the most quoted of all the, all the prophets in the Bible. I, God, in my grace, have summoned you and have grasped you by your hand. I created you and appointed you a covenant of people, Lor Goyim, to be a light to nations. Bottom line, the way I say it is we are the God squad. For those who are old enough to remember the Mod Squad, which is an American TV show that came out in like the late 60s, early 70s, it was very cutting edge. It had like a woman who was a cop, a black guy who was a cop with a big afro and some, they actually had a white male, I still had him on TV. So <laughs> we, but we're the God Squad. We're the messengers of meaning. Our job individually and collectively is to live and act in a way that inspires the world and elevate humanity back to the relationship with God, which is the purpose of creation. Get us back on target. Basically, it's what's called a plot rewrite. This happens in Hollywood sometimes. Like the end, there's a movie that came out called, uh, it was called World War Z. It was, a, it was a Brad Pitt zombie apocalypse movie that came out years ago. The end was so bad, they pulled the release date and they, and they released it six months later and reshot the end of the movie. The original plot was what? Humanity hangs out in the garden building relationship with God, but to use an American football analogy. Humanity fumbled the ball and Abraham picked it up and ran with it. So we have a plot rewrite. The new plot of not just Jewish history, but of all of human history is humanity returns to God. Jewish people lead the way. And when I'm, when I'm teaching in Jerusalem, I'm always telling my students, guys, you got to start looking at history with Jewish lenses and Jewish software. Now, I went to public school. I wasn't raised religious at all, as you heard before. And the history I learned a thousand years ago, I used to call it the history of the dead white guys of Europe. It was all about Europe, forget Asia, forget Africa. And it was all about, you know, Alexander and Pharaoh and Napoleon and World War I and the French Revolution. It was all centered on empires and power because empires and power are like the exciting parts of the movie, the battle scenes. It's not the plot of the movie. It's just the thing that gets your attention. Like the waiter dropping the tray in the restaurant. I love in Israel when he yells Mazel Tov when he does that. Yeah. The only thing better is in the plane lands and there's when they clap. Like, what did you expect? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, but... But I tell my students, if you start looking, if you look at the world, for instance, with infrared, x-ray, ultraviolet, as opposed to just normal visible light, the picture is very, very different. And I tell my students, and it's something we should all learn to do, even if we're raised, connected, and looking at the world more that there's a God in the picture, we have to start looking at the world this way also. And then everything starts to look different, and seemingly disconnected events start to fit together and make sense, and history becomes empirical like science. What am I demonstrating? Gravity. Remember that famous line attributed to Einstein? What's the definition of insanity? Same repeating thing. the same, he, he never said it by the way. It's not an Einstein quote. Repeating, this, repeating the same experiment, I'll drop it a thousand times, maybe it eventually will fly up. Maybe in Australia. <laughs> <laughs> Einstein didn't say that, but you know what he did say? My favorite Einstein line, so what's the difference between genius and, and stupidity? To genius has limits. <laughs> <laughs> it's a great quote. But my favorite quote about history is really, is, is Lord Bolingbroke, British Lord, a little bit of anti-Semite, but most of them were. He has a great quote. He said, history is philosophy teaching by examples. Think about that. You know, you could talk about things theoretically. A communist and a capitalist 120 years ago could talk about which economic system was destined to, to take over the world because communism believed that human nature and economic theory would lead the world towards a worker's paradise. Let's run that through a century plus of human history. What do we see? Capitalism may not be perfect, but communism is the worst political economic idea ever thought up in human history, which is credited with the death of possibly 100 million people in the last 100 years. So with that in mind, because I'm teaching this stuff usually in a class with Jews who are, don't know anything about Judaism, and I tell them humanity returns to God, Jewish people lead the way. A guy asked me years ago, he said, Rabbi, wait, 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 time out. What's the world's population? What's the world's population today, guys? Eight billion. Eight billion. How many, what's the... He goes, 8 billion. He goes, how many Jews are in the world, he asked me? 14 million. Or something. What percentage of the world is Jewish? 0.2%. Point, but we do have 22% of the Nobel Prizes since 1990, which is 11,500% more than we should have. But that's a side point. But 0.2%. He said, Rabbi, you're telling me Jews aren't even 1% of the world's population, but I should believe the plot of human history is humanity returns to God, Jewish people lead the way? So I said, based on this idea, that history is philosophy teaching by example, I can demonstrate clearly two examples that clearly illustrate, despite our teeny tiny size, we play a very outsized role in human history. Example number one, the infantry example. 
And a lot of people here are very familiar with the military, unlike in America, where very few people I ever teach have done the military. But any army unit in the world, um, we used to go on, I was in Givati a thousand years ago, like Yeshua bin Nun was my commanding officer. But when we used to go on patrol, we used to go on patrol, we would go two by two with one guy in the front. All, all infantry units do the same thing. The guy in the front is called, I once asked that in a class, and a guy yells out, dead! <laughs> God forbid. He, someone said it. Point man. Point man, exactly. Point man. Point man is a position of tremendous responsibility. He's out in front. He's leading the way. But it's also the position of the greatest danger. Because who's going to walk into the enemy first? The minefield first. The ambush. When humanity fumbled the ball and we picked it up and ran with it, we became the point nation of history. And this point, which we're going to get to a little later, so I'm not going to spend time on it now, is ultimately the explanation for why anti-Semitism, what really causes anti-Semitism. We walk into evil first. It has like, a, its sights are always on us first. So that's one way we see, despite our teeny tiny size, we play a ridiculously powerful role in history. Evil is going to come at us. We'll talk about that a little bit. The other way we see the disproportionate role we play in history, there we are, the point people of history, is going back to the movie analogy I started out with. In Hollywood, the, the actors are stacked in a pyramid. The top of the pyramid is the smallest number of actors, but the most important ones, right? The lead actors. Who comes below that? Supporting actors, then the bit parts. Then you got the walk-ons, the people sitting in the restaurant, walking on the street. On the set, there's no one who's not there for a reason. There's no random people stumbling around there. But people play different roles. Now, to be the lead actor, to be one of these A-list actors, you know, like Brad Pitt or Jennifer Lawrence or someone like that, or Dwayne The Rock, he doesn't actually act, he just looks big. But to be one of those guys, it's pretty cool because you get paid a ton of money and everyone loves you. What's the one downside of being so famous? No privacy. no privacy, paparazzi. Wherever you go, you're always in the news. Everyone's always photographing you and hounding you. But that's in fantasy world of Hollywood. But in his story, the real story, when we chose for ourselves, when Abraham chose for us this unique responsibility, we became the lead actors in the story. We're the fewest number of people. We got the most significant roles. But unlike in Hollywood, we don't get the fame and the fortune. But boy, do we get the paparazzi. And boy, are we seeing that now. Look how, look how the world's going nuts on Israel, behaving in a way that no other country in any similar, more difficult fighting situation never been, not since Stalingrad, and the world is going nuts. It's, it's crazy. The double standard, what, I, what I'm saying is true. This is the way it has to be. You know who said it the best? The late, great newspaper columnist, Charles Krauthammer. He said, Jews is news. And since good news is no news and only bad news makes news, when a Jew is perceived to do something wrong or the Jewish state, even though it behaves far better than anyone else in the world, the world will go nuts on Israel, which is why the UN, you know, the UN, they, they spent, they, they've condemned Israel more than every other country in the world combined in the last 50 years. That's crazy. The French are telling us how to behave. You know, we say in America, Statue of Liberty had both hands up when it left Paris. Hope there's no French people in there. They're going to be insulted. Anyway. <laughs> But guys, if what I'm saying is true, this is the way it has to be. Like Charles Krauthammer said it the best, Jews is news. And since good news is no news, only bad news makes news, the world is going to go nuts on us. But this was said much earlier by Bilam, who was hired to curse us, when out of his mouth comes one of the greatest truisms of being Jewish. We are a nation that dwells alone, is not reckoned amongst the nations. Like I always tell my students, being Jewish might not be comfortable, but it's always meaningful. And the world is always going to remind us that you Jewish people and you Jewish state in the words of that old Hebrew national commercial that some people in America might remember with Uncle Sam from like 50 years ago, he's standing under the scary looking sky and the announcer says, United States Department of Agriculture allows you to add this many animal fat and body parts and bones and grizzle into your hot dogs. That's sausages for everyone who's not American. <laughs> but of us. Anyway, the, uh, and, he's, and, he's look, he's like, and he looks up at the scary sky and he goes, and then the announcer says, Hebrew national, we have to answer to a higher authority. Uh -huh. Take out Hebrew national, put in Hebrew nation. You have one of the greatest truisms of what being Jewish is about. We will never be treated like anyone else because even subconsciously the world is aware, like Bilam is saying, you Jewish people and you Jewish state, we have to answer to a higher authority. So now that we appreciate what the plot of the story is and what our unique role is and how despite the fact that we're so teeny, we play such a central role in that story, it's another good thing to do, especially at difficult times like now, to appreciate how supernatural our history is. The problem is that when supernatural and weird happens to you all the time, what does it become? Ordinary. Normal. And there's nothing normal about us. I want to step back. You know who said it the best, by the way? First prime minister of Israel, who was? 
David Ben-Gurion, who was not religious, but who knew his Bible and his history. He had 6,000 books in his little tiny you know, shack in Stay Bokeh. He, he really read a lot. What does Ben-Gurion say? In Israel, in order to be a realist, you must believe in miracles. As a Jew, in order to be a realist, you've got to believe in miracles. The problem is we don't appreciate. The other problem is, is when rabbis say it, no one believes what rabbis say about Judaism. I always find it's much better to, to get non-Jews quoting. When non-Jews says it, oh, now it's something that's got to, we got to take seriously. So a little, a little bit of inspiration for us so we could stand back and get a little perspective, not just in our past, but what's going on now. This is Alexander Hamilton, who, by the way, may have been Jewish. Now he's just got a musical named after him. Yeah, sorry, he was born in the Bahamas. It's an interesting question. Anyway, progress of the Jews from their earliest history to the present time has been and is entirely out of the ordinary course of human affairs. Is it not fair conclusion that this cause also is an extraordinary one? In other words, that it is the effect of some great providential plan, which is a fancy way of saying what? God's hand in history. How about Thomas Newton, Bishop of Bristol, England, 18th century? I love this quote. The preservation of the Jew is really one of the most single and illustrious acts of divine providence. And what but a supernatural power could have preserved them in such a manner as none other upon the earth hath been preserved? Our very survival, the fact that we're sitting here today, supernatural. And, and a great quote by a Soviet-era historical philosopher by the name of Nikolai Berdyaev. He writes, the survival of the Jews, their resistance to destruction, their endurance under absolutely peculiar conditions, and the fateful role played by them in history, all this point to the particular and mysterious foundations of their destiny. Anyone who stands back and looks at it objectively sees this does not make any sense. Last but not least, one more very inspiring quote from my favorite, one of my favorite American authors, Mark Twain, whose real name is? Wow, you guys definitely know stuff who not only is a great American author, he has seven patents for elastic and suspenders. That's braces for all non-Americans, Australians, South Africans, New Zealand, whatever. You're going to ask, what did you learn from Ken Spiro last night? That Mark Twain has seven patents for suspenders. Okay. What does Mark Twain say? Properly, the Jew ought hardly to be heard of. But he is heard of, has always been heard of. His contributions to the world's list of great names are, are way out of proportion to the weakness of his numbers. He has made a marvelous fight in this world in all ages and has done it with his hands tied behind him. The fact that we survived and we transformed the world yet with most hated people on the planet Earth is such a ridiculous combination, but anyone looking at it objectively, whoa. And the way I like to explain it, bottom line, if you look at our historical experience, there's a famous quote, they won the battles but lost the war. We lost most of the battles. Okay, Hanukkah, after 25 years of fighting, the Greeks gave up, but we lost a lot. We lost our country twice. We went into exile. We've been persecuted, hounded, exiled. You know, they come after us. But what war did we win? And you can see, we've been in this war a long time. Look what Seneca, all the Roman writers of 2,000 years ago plus, hate Jews. But look what he says. They even begrudgingly give us compliments. This abominable nation has succeeded in spreading its customs throughout all the lands. The conquered have given their laws to the conquerors. What does that mean? We didn't conquer Rome. But the impact of Judaism... Ah, everyone make sure to turn the phone off. This doesn't happen. No, it's okay. We just, if anyone else has it. Okay. Ah, there we go. That was our musical interlude. Okay. The conquerors have given their laws to the conquerors. What's the impact we have had? It's been twofold, as we talked about at the very beginning. Number one is, bottom line, we literally weaned a huge chunk of the world off of amoral polytheism, because out of Judaism, the mothership, will come two offshoot faiths, Christianity and Islam, which will convert billions of people to a worldview that's essentially based on Judaism. That's one huge impact. That's spiritually the most transformative idea in all of human history. And as I said at the very beginning, also in terms of politics, if you study the history of the early modern period and the evolution of liberal democracy overwhelmed, the Jewish impact is monumental. You know, I said it the best, John Adams, second president of the United States. He says, I will insist the Hebrews have done more to civilize men than any other nation. If I were an atheist and believed in blind eternal fate, I should still believe that fate had ordained the Jews to be the most essential instrument for civilizing the nations. If I were an atheist of another sect, I should believe the chance had ordered the Jews to preserve and propagate to all mankind the doctrine of a supreme, intelligent, wise, almighty sovereign of the universe, which I believe to be the great essential principle of all morality and consequently of all civilization. And he's 100% right. And if you're running for president today, I would definitely be voting for him. <laughs> 
So the reality, and here's another great example, Paul Johnson, the late great, just passed away last year. He said, the Jewish vision became the prototype for many similar grand designs for humanity, both divine and man-made. The Jews therefore stand at the center of the perennial attempt to give human life the dignity of purpose. We have been, in terms of giving humanity a positive, deterministic view of we're getting to a destination of elevating the world that comes uniquely and exclusively directly or indirectly from us, the Jewish people. One last quote from Thomas Cahill, who wrote this great book called The Gift of the Jews. He says it beautifully. Unbelievers might wish to stop for a moment and consider how completely God, this Jewish God of justice and compassion, undergirds all our values. And that is just possible that human effort without this God is doomed to certain failure. All who share the outrageous dreams of universal brotherhood, peace, and justice, who dream the dreams and see the vision of the great prophets, must bring themselves to contemplate the possibility that without God, there is no justice. Whoa. Maybe we should read that in the UN. So bottom line, and there it is right on the money, in God we trust, I love it, uh, my favorite American president, Abraham Lincoln, we Jews have been the most transformative force in civilizing the world and giving the world a spiritual direction. So now we understand our history, how unique it is, how transformative we've been, how clearly it indicates, despite our teeny tiny size, this crazy idea of us playing the central role very seems to be very provable and clearly true. What's our time frame? Because we want to move towards the end of the story so we know what we should be expecting. How long does the story take now that we understand the plot? So it says in multiple places in the Talmud, it says it in Sanhedrin, it says it in Rosh Hashanah, but in 97a it says the world is to exist for 6,000 years. In the first 2,000 years there was desolation, 2,000 years the Torah flourished, and the next 2,000 years of the Messianic era, but through our many iniquities all these years have been lost. Now it doesn't mean from the Big Bang to the end of time is 6,000 years, it means from the end of day six, when God puts the soul into humanity and so to speak takes his watch off and says now you start keeping time from your perspective human beings, a maximum of 6,000 years. Where does the six come in 6,000 besides the number of times at a wedding or bar mitzvah you go to the smorgasbord before you go for dessert? <laughs> exactly. The six days of creation, which are also mirrored by the six days of the week, which we know begin on Sunday. And the Talmud is dividing, is saying each of these days of creation is not only equivalent to a day of a week, it's equivalent to a millennia, a thousand years. And it subdivides into three 2,000 year parts. The first 2,000 years from Adam to Abraham is called desolation, which is actually the Hebrew expression is to vol, as used in the creation story, formless and void, which means there's no relationship with God. We, we're the only people believing in one God at that point. The next 2,000 years, okay, I mean, no relationship with God until we get to Adam. The next 2,000 years called Torah is the creation of the Jewish people. That's from Abraham onward. That's Jewish national history in the land of Israel up to the year 200 of the common era, destruction of the second temple, and a little bit after, and the exile. And the last 2,000 years, the period we're in now, is called Mashiach, which doesn't mean the Messiah is here, but that's when humanity collectively returns to God with us leading the way. And if you overlay this map on what really happened, that is exactly what happened. And in the last, especially the end part, the last 1,800 years or so, we have seen the greatest spiritual moral transformation in human history that I just talked about. Of billions of people whose ancestors used to be those amoral polytheists now more or less buying into a world which is basically based on Jewish worldview. But we want to focus on this last period of time, the Mashiach part. This is the part we're in, and this is how we approach the end of the story. And we know that this part... Judaism says is divided into two parts. The first part is normal kind of history. The second part is called Yemei Mashiach, the Messianic era. By the way, it's amazing how many of my students who don't know much about Judaism think it's a Christian idea. Christianity stole the concept from us, changed the definition, used us again, use it against us and don't pay us any royalties for it. But it's very much a Jewish idea. And Mash Mashiach is not the end of the story, by the way. Because like days of the week, you have Sunday, well, we don't use the pagan God names. Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Woden's Day, Thor's Day, Freya's Day. Now you know they're all Viking names. Two is the Norse God of War, in case you're wondering who that one is. But we get to Friday night at sunset. What do we enter? Yom Shishi, Shabbat, which is a different reality than the other six days of the week, as you guys know very, very well. So too, when we get to human history, the last period of time, when you get to the year 6,000, you've entered the seventh millennia. Okay, and you get to the end of the sixth day, you enter the seventh day, and that is called Olam Haba. We're not going to talk about that at all. That's when the world goes back to the way it was before it got messed up. That's where Tchiat HaMetim, Resurrection of the Dead, Final Judgment, takes place there. But before we get to that 
Shabbat of human history, we have a transitional period, which is the idea of the Mashiach. As, as the Rambam, Maimonides brings out beautifully, he says, no one, no one think that in the days of the Messiah, any of the laws of nature will be set aside or any innovations will be introduced into creation. The world will follow its normal course. In that era, there will be neither famine nor war, neither jealousy nor strife. Blessings will be abundant, comforts within the reach of all. The one preoccupation will be to know the Lord, which is the whole purpose of creation. So the Mashiach we know comes at the end and acts as a catalyst. What does a catalyst do in chemistry? Speeds up the process. He's a person with a certain lineage, leadership skills, spiritual connection, whose job is to get not just the Jewish people, but the entire world back to the garden, so to speak. So here's how the entire story looks now. So if we look forward, it says, it's, it also says that, it also says, my mind goes on and says, let no one think that in the days of Messiah, any of the laws of nature will be set aside or innovations will be introduced. Did we read this already? Yeah. We did that already. Why is it there again? Never mind. Okay, we're going the wrong way. Okay, Shabbat, there we go. Let's go this way. Here we go. Now, clearly, we're going to get to exactly where we are. We are at the finish. We're close to the finish. We're going to get to the exact years in a few minutes. What's the problem with being near the finish line? Sorry? Like, what's the famous story about one, one animal being way, way ahead of the other and taking? It's one of Aesop's fables, right? The hare and the tortoise. He's way far ahead, so what does he do? He becomes complacent. He lies down at the end. He wakes up in time to see what? The tortoise, which was way behind, crossing the finish line. So Aesop himself says exactly that point. Don't get complacent. The most dangerous time is at the end, when you can see the finish line in sight is not the time. Because we also understand, and I learned this, the last book I wrote, which is, I should write another one soon because I need to come up with a book every few years. The last book I wrote is called Destiny, but it's all based on a, something I noticed about how all the themes of all the great Hollywood movies, they take place sometimes a long time ago in a galaxy far away, sometimes in different worlds, but the plot is always the same. There's always a little superhero, right? Who often doesn't know he's a little superhero. The world is descended into some kind of darkness with some nefarious evil force, you know, infesting everywhere. And he trying, he's always trying to, you know, he doesn't even want the job. He has a series of encounters with this really big bad guy that he's trying to avoid, but his role is way too central. He can't escape his destiny. He should have lost many, many times over, but he, sometimes he survives just barely. And when is the, and at the end of the story, what always happens with it's Darth Vader or Voldemort or Saruman? There's always a final showdown between whom? Hero. Our superhero and the big bad guy, Darth Vader or Saruman or Voldemort, and the hero wins, evil's destroyed. But the, but the plot always, the story beats are always the same, and the greatest danger, the climax, always takes place where? At the end of the story. And so too, in his story, the real story, the most dangerous time is the finish line. If you look at any of those movies, by the way, you'll see, run any through your, your mind, any of these, and you'll see it's the exact same thing. And the finish line is when the greatest danger is approaching, and that's the period of time we're in. I like to spend the remaining time we have focusing on that period of time. So if we look at Rabbi Elchanan Wasserman, who is one of the great leaders of European Jewry, who was murdered by the Nazis in 1941, he writes, if we wish to comprehend the nature of events in our lives, we must seek out those verses and teachings of the rabbis which relate to the period preceding the Messiah. That is the transitional period between the end of exile and the redemption. If we compare what is written to the events taking place, we will see a mirror image of everything that is happening to us. Everything mentioned in the Torah becomes concrete fact, and conversely, nothing is happening that was not predicted by the Torah in advance. So what I want to do is show you some really interesting, some prophecies, and some of them are in the Torah. A lot of them are actually not, from some great mystical Jewish thinkers, and we'll see which direction it is sending us towards. So Rabbi Chaim Vital who is the main student of Rabbi Isaac Luria in the golden age of Sfat in the 16th century, he wrote a book called Eitz Hadat, which is based on the teachings of the Ari, Isaac Luria. And he brings in a really interesting concept. He says, at the end of days, Israel is destined to experience the Ishmaelite exile. This fifth and last exile will be the most difficult of all, is the exile of Ishmael. What does it mean by fifth and last? Who's read the book of Daniel? So Daniel has the idea of these beasts, these four beasts. Each of them represent the great ancient oppressors. Not necessarily they all exiled us from our land, but the great oppressors of the Jewish people in biblical times are whom? Babylon, Persia, Greece, and Rome. We're, throwing, we're getting a new idea here. At the end of days, there's going to be a fifth, the Ishmaelites. So who are Ishmaelites? Guess who exactly? Our neighbors, our cousins down the street. And we know also they had this idea that's brought down in Navi from Zechariah and, and Yeheskel of Gog and Megog. You're all familiar with that. 
We read about it in the Sukkot especially. So the prophecy, of the, this is from Zechariah. The prophecy of the word of Hashem concerning Israel. Behold, I am making Jerusalem a cup of poison for all the peoples all around, and all the nations of the world will gather against it. As we approach the end of the story, the nations of the world will line up, and we can't forget exactly who Gog, Megog, Meshech, Tuval, there's much rabbinic speculation, but the overall theme is very clear. The nations of the world will line up and try and basically prevent us from getting to the end game, this final act of redemption. The Zohar, which you're all familiar with, Jewish, Jewish tradition, you know, it's written by Rabbi Shimon Bar, Bar Yochai. It's a very esoteric commentary on the five, on the Chumash. It says, the children of Ishmael are destined at that time to incite all the nations of the world to come to Jerusalem together with them. As it is written, I will gather all the nations to Jerusalem for war. So the nations of the world line up to try and stop us. The Arabs are the tip of the spear, and the focus is going to be on Jerusalem. And Rabbi Moshe Cordovero, the great, one of the most, the author of Tomer Devora, Pardes Rimonim, the person the Ari came to learn from in Sfat in the 16th century, he writes, look, it's an amazing quote. This is from 500 years ago. All the nations will ready themselves against Jerusalem and make peace amongst themselves. They will turn against Israel to annihilate it for having established its own government. It will be a time of distress for Yaakov, yet they will not collapse, but be saved from their distress. And this is exactly the point we see. And as you notice, by the way, the period of time we're in now, and actually made this presentation before October 7th, you can see the explosion. This is people like who has anti-Semitic, look, the Middle East is like the, obviously the hotbed of, it's amazing how many people in the world are not big fans of the Jewish people. But if you look over here at this graph and it's missing the current date, the biggest spikes of anti-Semitism, you can see the years here, it's like 2008, 2009, 2014. What do they correspond to? Explosions of anti-Semitism. And if we could do the current one that's going on now, it would be right off the chart. England up, it's like England 600% up, America 400% up. What, is, what are they all connected with? Um, What's going on in Israel? Wars in Gaza. Thus, without a doubt, showing us very clearly that anti-Semitism, this is just another form of anti-Semitism, and the excuse it hides behind now is Israel bashing, but it doesn't take too long, as we saw in like the Sydney Opera House on October 7th. We hadn't even counterattacked yet. They light up the Opera House in blue and white, and then a few hours later, what are the Arabs outside screaming about? Gas the Jews. Don't even bother with a few days of like yelling at Israel. Go right to the point, gas the Jews, Hitler, you were right. Uh, these are not images from this this going on October 7th. These have been images that have been going on for years and years and years. And the point we have to focus on, which is so clear because we can't get distracted by geopolitical realities that Israel bashing is the final excuse that anti-Semitism is hiding behind. With that in mind, then we have to focus, okay, if this is just an excuse not to get distracted, like if you're a doctor, don't get distracted by the sores on the skin. You gotta get to the disease inside to know how to treat it properly. Let's just focus for a couple of minutes on what is a huge topic. I'm going to do it very, very quickly on what Judaism says really drives anti-Semitism because we're accused of a lot of stuff. We kidnap Christian babies, use their blood to bake matzo. We in league with the devil. We kill Jesus. We control the world's economy, seismic activity, solar flares. We trigger tsunamis in Southeast Asia to drown Indonesia with tidal waves. We release sharks into the Red Sea to destroy Egyptian tourism. We send vultures to spy on Saudi Arabia. We steal Iran's cloud cover. We have a space laser. By the way, if anyone believed even 10% of that, no one would mess with us. <laughs> Maybe we should get like the, the, all the Federation guys and the Knesset together and say, it's true, so don't mess with us. But all those excuses aside, I want to show you a couple of quotes from Adolf Hitler. Now, I know it sounds weird. How could you quote Hitler talking about Jews? Usually Jew haters aren't so clear, but sometimes the people that hate us the most get us the best. You look at these quotes and you tell me, how, how clear thinking is this evil human being? He says, the Ten Commandments have lost their validity. Conscience is a Jewish invention. It is a blemish like circumcision. Wow. That is the greatest backhanded compliment ever given to the Jewish people. And it's true. We invented the idea of a God-given ethical monotheism, a standard of morality that you cannot mess with as a human being because it comes from the big guy upstairs. Now, by the way, who first went after circumcision in human history? Which civilization? Which war? What period of time? Greeks. The Greeks and Hanukkah which is not a physical war for liberation from Greek occupation. It's only when the Greeks, with their self-hating Jewish allies, went after Judaism in history's first religious ideological war. In paganism's war against monotheism, that's when we rebelled, and the first thing they go after is circumcision. Paganism's war against monotheism. I'm going to show you just one more quote, but it's blow away. This is the words of the Hitler Youth Song. 
This is hiding in plain sight and no one focuses on it. I believe the last seven words of this song are the seven most important words to understand not only the Holocaust, but all anti-Semitism. This is the English translation, obviously. We are the joyous Hitler youth. We don't need any Christian virtue. Our leader is our savior. The Pope and rabbi shall be gone. We want to be pagans once again. Wow. Why isn't this at Yad Vashem? We have been dragging the world, kicking and screaming towards a vision of morality and absolute morality. And anti-Semitism, regardless of the excuse that hides behind, is always on the deepest level, even though most people aren't even aware of it. A rebellion against the national historic mission of us, the little superhero, to bring a vision of values based on relationship with God into the world. And the problem with that, for those Jews who are sitting there self-flagellating and you know, not in our name and all these people running around screaming, it's amazing how many self-hating Jews are coming out of the woodwork now, is that the, the, the ant we may not know what we're about, but the hater of anti-Semitism, the, the person who hates us, you know, he sees it clearly, even if we don't see it. Like I always say, there's only one line in Auschwitz, regardless of what you believe politically or religiously. The people who come after us, even if we forget our mission, like Heschel, you know Abraham Joshua Heschel? Great, he was very big in the conservative movement. He's actually himself an observant Jew. But he said the Jewish people are messenger who forgot the message. But the hater of the message, even if we forget the message, he knows we carry it in our spiritual DNA. And if I had more time, I'll come back, I'll do the class on why the Jews in depth. You'll see Hitler totally understands that the impact of the Jews comes from the Jewish soul. He sees it 100%. Even uneducated Jews, you know, in terms of their Judaism, carry this drive within them. The problem with that is if we lose our direction, like Heschel's saying, we, we're Jews for every ism but Judaism. Notice how many Jews are pushing causes and movements have nothing to do with Judaism because it's on our spiritual DNA to always want to do tikkun olam. But the problem is, is if we, the God Squad, are not pushing the idea of God in the world, what's the world going to be full of? This is Will Herbert. Will Herbert is an amazing, Herbert is an amazing thinker from the middle of the 20th century. He was literally more than half a century ahead when he saw what was going to happen in the world when we disconnect from the God-given source of morality. He says, the attempt made in recent decades, he's saying this in 1951, by secularist thinkers to disengage the moral principles of Western civilization from their scripturally based religious context in the assurance that they could live a life of their own as, quote, humanistic, unquote, ethics has resulted in our cut flower culture. Look what he says now. Cut flowers retain their original beauty and fragrance, but only so long as they retain the, vi the vitality that they have drawn from their now severed roots. After that is exhausted, they wither and die. So with the freedom, brotherhood, justice, and personal dignity, the values that form the moral foundation of our civilization. Without the life-giving power of the faith out of which they have sprung, they possess neither meaning nor vitality. And he's saying this over 70 years ago, but he completely nails what's going wrong with the world. We transform the world as a people by bringing the idea of one God and absolute standard of morality in. That has now been pushed aside by a huge chunk of the world and replaced with just vague ideas of liberal thought that are not based on this. And look at the direction the world is going. It's going in an opposite direction and it's coming after us first. The, the person who said it the best is the British writer G.K. Chesterton. He said, when men stop believing in God, they don't believe in nothing. They believe in anything. And boy, do we see that today when people are literally challenging biological realities. Forget arguing over ideas. That's how insane the world is now. And basically, I say humanity is basically a rudderless ship at the moment. We've lost our direction. And the fundamental struggle, my friends, is the struggle over truth. And Judaism, what's the abs The ultimate truth in Judaism is what? God. Everything that is true, whether it's metaphysical or physical, whether it's a law of nature or a moral or spiritual principle, emanates from God. Anything that's the opposite is going to be evil and wrong. But that's exactly because we Jews are not like leading the way where we're supposed to. What's going to happen? You know, Rav Chaim of Volusion, he said it the best. He said, this is the best explanation for anti-Semitism. We should put this on a refrigerator, by the way, this quote. I don't know about you guys. My fridge is the smartest wisdom one. It's got all the magnets with all the great quotes on it. He says, when Jews don't make Kiddush, Gentiles make Havdalah. He doesn't mean this literally. I don't have to explain to you what Kiddush and Havdalah are, but we know. When we don't elevate the world, you know, there's a basic principle in physics. Nature abhors a vacuum. You guys heard of this principle? Vacuums will be filled with something. If we don't, the Jewish people, fill it with the ideas, the principles, the morality that comes from relationship with God that has transformed the world, the opposite values will come, and the opposite values are evil. When evil comes into the world, it's not only going to turn the world upside down, it's going to come after us first. That is so important. This is the critical idea we have to understand.
because this goes back to our very essence of who we are as a people, being the role model for the world. And the way I say it, if we don't make truth our target, humanity will make the Jewish people and the Jewish state theirs. And what really is driving anti-Semitism, besides the revolt against you know, the deepest level, the, you know, the, this, this God-given source of morality, and trying to replace it with the natural concept, as Hitler calls it, of just being an animal, the strong survive the weaker lunch. That's the way nature works. It's brutal, but it's balanced. Not only is the world going to go in the opposite direction, it's going to make us the target. It's going to make the Jewish people the target. And you can test this like gravity. And the world is basically, George Gilder wrote a great book called The Israel Test. Anyone read this book? There's two books that everyone has to have. One is Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin's book called Why the Jews, where he goes in detail into this idea of ethical monotheism being the source of what focuses, anti-Semites are focusing on. Gilder says, just as the Jew, because Ten Dennis Prager and Joseph Telushkin in their book say that you know miners used to bring canaries into coal mines back 100 years ago before there was modern gas detection equipment because the bird is more susceptible to the gas than a human being. You don't even smell the gas before you know it, you're dead. If Polly starts rolling over and having convulsions, get out of the mine. It's just Jews are humanity's canary in the coal mine. We're the litmus test. Evil, show me how a country's treating its Jews. I'll tell you all about where they're going in terms of their morality and their ethics and their values and their democracy. George Gilder, non-Jew, in his book, The Israel Test, he says it also the same way. He says, show me what a country thinks about Israel. I'll tell you all about their, their, their morality and their democracy. You think it's an accident that Iran, North Korea, Venezuela, Cuba hate Israel? When evil comes into the world, it will target the Jewish people. When evil comes into the world, it will target the Jewish state. So what do we do with this? It's kind of scary stuff, I know, but it's a wake-up call. This is, <laughs> I, I, have to, I just want to read you. This is very interesting. That, that we're getting very close to the end. I know you've been very patient. But the Mishnah, let's go at it for a second. I don't want you reading it quite yet. The Mishnah is a, is a, is a legal document, but there's only one Navu in all the Mishnah. It's in the ninth parak of Sota. And I remember reading this like 40 years ago and thinking, wow, this is pretty cool. But reading it like four months ago, it was really a, wow. So this is the this is the mission in Sota talking about what you know what will the world will be like before Mashiach comes. In the times of the approach of the Messiah, impotence will increase, puts Bagasa, right? And high costs will pile up. Huh. Although the vine shall bring forth its fruit, the wine will nevertheless be expensive. I think that's really cool. Judaism got inflation before anyone else. Simple laws of economy, no, are if you have an abundance of a product. The price will go down, but it doesn't take into consideration modern mon monetary policy. If you print too much money, you have more dollars chasing the same amount of goods, so the price goes up. Interesting. Nevertheless expensive. And the, and the monarchy shall be heresy. I guess they visited the Knesset. And there will be no one to give reproof about it. The meeting place of the sages will become a place of promiscuity, and the ga Galilee shall be destroyed, and the Gavlon will be desolate. And the men of the border shall go around from city to city to seek charity, but they will find no mercy. And the wisdom of the scribes will, be, will putrefy, and people who fear sin will be held in disgust. Van emet tienedevet. And truth will be absent which is the number one issue that you see in the world. That's your truth. I have a different truth. That's your narrative. I have a different one. By the way, the word used is nedelet, which comes from the word eda, which is a flock. And the rabbi is commenting on this, saying, in the end of days, the world's going to split into two flocks of animals, which have nothing to do with each other. That's how split they will be. Youth will shame the face of the elders. Elders will stand before the minors. Normal family relations will be ruined. A son will disgrace a father. A daughter will rise up against a mother. A daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. A man's enemies will be the members of his household. The face of the generation will be like the face of a dog. The rabbis say, just as a dog walks in front of the master and the fool thinks the dog leads, so too in the end of days, there's no real leadership anymore. <laughs> Bless you. It's called sneezing the, sneezing the truth twice. A son will no longer be ashamed before his father upon what is there for us to rely only upon our father in heaven. Whoa. Pretty heavy stuff. Well, let's go back now to this for just a second, guys, and look for a minute here. A little bit of a timeline here. Where are we? What year are we in? Dum, 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 dum. Oh, That's the wrong image. I had a different one here. We're at five. What? 6,000 is the maximum. 5,784. What day of the week are we in? When you hit 5,000, what day of the week are you in? Sorry, Friday, right. 5,000 is Friday afternoon. 5,000 5, 5, is the beginning of the day. 5,500 is the morning. 5,750, three quarters of the way through the day. 5,784, where are we? Late Friday afternoon. This is the time in a Jewish home, like, you know, like I always say, like, when I'm teaching kids who aren't religious, if you're Shomer Shabbat, the wife's yelling at the husband, give him the shower, it's going to be Shabbos, 20 minutes. And you guys know Murphy's Law, the chance of the bread falling butter side down is directly proportional to the price of the carpet and those important laws of reality. What's Murphy's Law of Shabbat? 
No matter when you start preparing, even if you start doing your filter fishing, plucking your chicken and doing your cholent on Sunday morning, what are you still doing a half hour before Shabbat hits? You're still running around like a chicken with your head cut off because everything gets speeds up and gets really intense as we approach the hard deadline. Uh, there it is. There, that's where it is. Okay. Of, of, uh, of uh, Shabbat, so too. And how much time do we have for maximum? You can see 216 years. There are Jewish sources that say, my friends, you can take 200 off the 216. Which means within a couple of years, the whole thing is over. Lions are lying down with lambs and having soya barbecues. The UN is getting together 15 times a day to pass pro-Israel resolutions. It's all over. Boom, boom, boom. <laughs> exactly. 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 So the Hafez Chaim, he says, the entire period, now I apologize, men should never talk about women giving birth. I once had a kidney stone, which is the only reason I dare to venture into this topic at all. <laughs> The entire period of the diaspora is like a pregnancy. The end of the exile will be like the pangs of childbirth. This is what the Talmud and Shabbat call the Chevle HaMashiach, the birth pangs of the Messiah. As our sages said, if you see suffering increasing and threatening to drown you like a river, expect him. So we know we're definitely getting to the end of the story. I don't need any Torah sources to tell me I don't have 216 years left. We got a big bucket of ice water thrown in our face on October 7th. Clearly, it's very clear to me the creator of the universe wants us to get to the end of the story, which is why we need to get the clarity, not to be passive, not to stand back and wait for redemption, but to be clear what our, as we say in the army speak, what our misima, what our mission is, what we're supposed to be doing individually and collectively as a people. The Zohar says something very interesting. I always tell people are trying to ask me, you know, when's the Messiah coming? I said, I don't know that. If I knew that, I'd be a prophet. If I was a prophet, I'd be working in Wall Street. I wouldn't be teaching. <laughs> but the Zohar says it's not God's will the date of the Messiah or arrival be revealed to man. But when the date draws near, even children will be able to make the calculation. And I believe pretty much that we can we'll be able to make that calculation very soon. But the point is not to freak out and get scared, obviously. The point is also not to ignore this. We can ignore it, but reality is reality. It's like gravity. If you ignore it, the same thing is going to happen. You jump off a roof as someone who believes in gravity. Now, first of all, I'm not freaking out. I'm not freaking out because as we saw, Jewish history is supernatural. If you're sitting in this room today, Jewish, it's unbelievable. What percentage of Jews lived in Israel in the year 1900? What percentage of the Jewish world lived in Israel in 1900? A half of 1%. Today, half the Jews in the world are living in Israel. That's crazy. That's three times more than the population, the growth of the world's population since the end of World War II. You know, in 1900, one Jew spoke Hebrew as his first language. Eliezer ben Yehuda's son, Ben Zion, who had a terrible childhood, no play dates. He couldn't talk to anyone. <laughs> Today, Hebrew is the language of half the Jews in the world. It's, we do not appreciate how supernatural it is. So I'm not freaking out. But that doesn't mean I'm going to be complacent. Now, I made a t-shirt I even brought to show you. I figured writing books is good, but I need a clothing line. Here's my t-shirt. Here's my t-shirt. I've sold out like crazy since October 7th. It says, civilizations, nations, and empires that have tried to destroy the Jewish people and their status today. It says, ancient Egypt, gone. Philistines, gone. Assyrian, Babylonian, Persian, Greek, Roman, Byzantine empires, gone, 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 gone. Crusaders, gone. Spanish Empire, gone. Nazi Germany, gone. Soviet Union, gone. Iran with three question marks. By the way, in this war and also in 2014, someone photoshopped out Iran and put Hamas and they put in progress. Hopefully we'll soon be adding them to the gone list. But it says at the bottom, the Jewish people, the smallest of nations with a friend in the highest of places, so be nice. <laughs> what do you think? One for every member of the General Assembly and two for the mullahs in Iran? A lot of Jews, by the way, are afraid to wear this shirt. Like, I can't wear it, don't kill me. I said, who, a Babylonian? He's gone. <laughs> Just don't wear it in, in Iran, you're fine. You know who buys and wears all these shirts? 90% of them are bought by? Evangelical Christians, mostly in America, they're always writing me on Instagram and Facebook. Rabbi Spiro will live in Yazoo, Mississippi, and I'll wear your t-shirt to my church because God loves the Jewish people. Because they see something that we hopefully see because we know the Torah and we see where the prophecies are going, but a lot of Jews don't see. But that doesn't mean, guys, that we can be complacent. Clearly, big things are happening. This was a big inflection point in Jewish history and in human history. So just to end with a little bit of a takeaway message, what we need to be doing individually and collectively. Some of this is not necessarily for you guys, you're a more advanced audience, as I would say, and committed, but the call to action, which is what you always wanna have at the end, what can I do? Okay, I'm awake, I realize it's happening, this is the story, I can ignore it, but it's gonna happen anyway, and I wanna bring it to an end as quickly and as painlessly as possible. Number one is, right, this is a great quote by a science fiction writer, Philip Dick, by the way, reality is what continues to exist whether you believe it or not. It's such a great quote. <laughs> 
I want to quote that to a lot of my very crazy left-wing friends. Number two, we have to be truth seekers. My Rosh Hashim, Rav Noah Weinberg, used to always to say the battle for life is the battle for sanity. We're always, you know, the Eight Sahara is always trying to put us to sleep. We have to stay awake and be focused. Number three, and this is not for you because you already are, but I always say you got to be educated. You can't represent the Jewish people till you know what the Jewish people represents. Look at how so many well-intended but poorly educated Jews are not only are not only assimilating, disappearing, but becoming even enemies of the Jewish people in the Jewish state. Because few things are worse than a Jew with that Jewish drive and that radical transformative thinking who doesn't have Torah software. You know, Jews without that stuff can be some of the most destructive people on the planet Earth. The Talmud in Tractate Beitza says if Jews didn't have Torah, they'd destroy the world. If you don't believe me, ask Bernie Madoff and Sam Bankman Freed and Meyer Lansky and all those other people, you know? We gotta be balanced. This is a huge point, by the way. We have to be quite, quite, we have to be, you guys, it's also not so much for you, but the Jewish world is split between the very extreme left, which is all about Ben Adam Lechavero, all these social justice movements, and also the most extreme part of the Orthodox world, which is all obsessed with this stuff, you know? How kosher can I keep? How this? All that stuff is great, but you gotta be twice as careful what comes out of your mouth as what you put in your mouth. We have to measure any stringences we take in terms of our relationship with God up there, how they're going to impact our fellow Jews. That's so important. We have to be united. This is crazy, you know? As we don't have to all agree with each other. That's not possible. Any parent gets the following line, especially if you have teenagers. You don't always like your children, but you always love them. Otherwise, they wouldn't live to maturity. As Roseanne Barr once said, now that I have teenagers, I realize why some mammals eat their young. We have to recognize we're, we're brothers and sisters. And again, this you guys all are the same hashkafa. When we're dealing with our fellow Jews, you're my brother, you're my sister. We have to focus on what unites us and not what divides us. Every major attack, whether it's the intifadas or the wars, have always been preceded in this country by internal strife within the Jewish world. I saw this coming before October. What was happening in Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, in Tel Aviv, in Simchas Torah. I said, I've never seen, I've been here a long time. I've never seen anything like that. It's like God is saying, my children, you want to kill each other? I'll send non-Jews to do it because I can't stand to watch you doing it to each other. God forbid when this is over, and unfortunately it's already starting, that we go back to anything like what we had before, because then I'm really scared what's going to happen next time. This is a powerful wake-up call. We have to be focused, right? We must be aware that we are the God squad. We have to wake up every morning and recognize whether it's dealing with our fellow Jews who may not be religious or the non-Jews, that our job, everything we do, little acts, we can be doing Kiddush Hashem daily. We can be doing little things that People focus positively on us and therefore positively on God and connect. We have to be proactive. Like I said, crowdfunding Kiddush Hashem is the way we got to do it. Now he's like, looking for ways to make a difference in this world is so important. Like I said, that's right. Like trifles make perfection, but perfection is no trifle. Most of us will not be people who will be able to do huge things that are going to change the course of human history. But you guys know how crowdfunding works, right? It's the idea that you, you get a millionaire to give you $10 million. Okay, but you can get... Five million people to give you 10 bucks each, you make a lot more money. All of us in little ways can make a big difference. And that's the big call. We cannot go back to sleep. We can't be following the same behavior pattern that we were doing before. Like they say, trifles make perfection, but perfection is no trifle. All of us doing little things make a big difference. And hopefully if we do that, guys, if we keep the unity, the proactivity, and we are Jews for Judaism in a positive way, then coming soon we get. Isn't that nice? I can't wait. And again, just to go back to end with the same quote that I we read before, but this is the most beautiful way it's been. God says to us right before he gives us the Torah at Mount Sinai, which is arguably the zenith of Jewish history. Now then, if you obey me faithfully and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all the peoples. Indeed, all the earth is mine, but you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And let's hope, my friends, that we merit to be unified, educated, proactive, and then we get peace for ourselves and the world and a happy ending to the story as quickly and as painlessly as possible. And thank you very much. Just very quick, I'm happy to take a few questions, no problem. Just to point out, those are my books, and I also do a weekly podcast on Anchor, Spotify, Google, and, and Apple. It's called Remember What's Next about current events in Jewish history. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, and that's my website with a lot of free content, you're welcome to also come up after and get my card, which has my contact information and the website address on it. Any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Okay. 
So we have someone who wants to. We do. We do. They're our biggest allies. They're our biggest allies of the Christian right. Um, when we left Egypt, we had the plan of darkness, which is supposed to have covered the death of those who were on board. What are we getting to and how do we know who's on board and who's not? Well, first of all, that's a great question, first of all. And I always say that the Egyptian narrative is a microcosm of the whole story of Jewish history till redemption. There should be, historians estimate that there should be minimum of 250 million Jews in this world today, given how many existed 2,000 years ago, maximum of 750 million Jews in the world. The fact that we are 14 million means that what? A teeny tiny fraction of the, for every person who's Jewish, there's hundreds of non-Jews with Jewish blood. So in the grand sweep of things, we see basically that only the, those of us who, you know, took the, we're here because of our ancestors. And all of us, if you're sitting in this room, we had ancestors who were expelled and tortured and last thing out of the mouth was Shema Yisrael. And they, they stuck to it. They stuck to the mission throughout history, enabled us to be here and, and come back to the land of Israel. Imagine what they would see to see us sitting here today. It's unbelievable. But also what we're seeing now, which in the world and also in the Jewish world is who's going to be on the ship when we finally get to the, get to the port. There's a lot of, this is, I'm just hoping, I don't know what's going to be with this, so many Jews. It's, it's crazy when you have Jews showing up and, you know, not in our name and literally protesting against Israel and apologizing for what we're doing. That's an excusable kind of stuff. But the pattern for that is laid aside that those people who are going to decide not to reconnect to who they are and what are, and their people and our mission, who knows what's going to be with them? I don't know. I, I, that's only God knows that kind of stuff. But it's clear to me that. In general, only if when we get to the end of the story, you know, 14, 15 million Jews seems like a lot of Jews, but it's only a fraction of what should be here, given what we were. And that's really the process we've been through throughout history. So only those who were dedicated and stuck to it will actually make it out. And the question is, who's going to make it to Israel? That's the point. I have a lot of friends who, who made Aliyah after COVID, by the way, or got citizenship because they, they couldn't get into Israel. It's like they were freaking out about that. And a lot of people are very scared, like they see what's going on. It's a big wake-up call. I just came back from two speaking tours back-to-back, -back, and I don't pull any punches nowadays. I say there's two kinds of Jews, those who are living in Israel and those who will be living in Israel. And do it now before you have to get into an emergency evacuation flight, which you might not make. I don't know what's going to happen, but clearly, you know, I always think God wants his children to return, which is why he gave us a state in 1948, and why, thank God, we're all here, and you guys made that decision. Not that it was easier, but because you had the clarity, this is the place we're supposed to be. This is the only outlet we can plug in as a people to really express ourselves and, and accomplish our mission in this world is the land of Israel. Any other questions, comments? Oh, okay. Thank you so much. Thank you.